So um, let's uh, reconvene then uh, with the conference program for this morning. So the next paper we're going to have is by Gabriel Turek from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he will also talk about experience in Rwanda and uh, focused on the VAT. So Gabriel, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to confirm you can all uh, see my slides. Yeah, yeah, it's very Great. clear. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the impacts of COVID-19 on firms and access to inputs and final sales and how there may be potential impacts on tax enforcement and revenues, um, particularly in the context of value added tax policy. And I'll, like Julia, be focusing on the context of Rwanda, which I think provides a representative um, example of tax policy and these effects in a low income country. But I think, given the nature of tax enforcement in Rwanda, can provide lessons for more developed countries as well. So to briefly sketch out where I'll go today, I'll talk first about the overview of the study I conducted, which involved a survey in partnership with the Rwandan government um, in January 2021, collecting data from firms, present briefly to you the findings, and then spend most of the time discussing what I think are potential implications for tax policy and specifically VAT policy. So the policy issue and one of the motivations for convening this conference is that COVID-19 um, and its associated lockdown measures have impacted tax revenues globally, both in the short run, but also with potentially longer run consequences. In the least developed countries and places like Rwanda, sustainable revenue sources are needed both to um, fund short and long run investment and economic development more generally. But in the context of COVID, they're necessary to support um, short run recovery programs and ongoing mitig mitigation efforts as the pandemic evolves. However, this is a tax setting with distinct features. It's characterized by limited enforcement resources available to tax authorities, which means they typically have to make uh, difficult choices um, given they face steeper opportunity costs between how to allocate those resources, both in enforcement, but also in investing in the design of tax policies themselves. This means that evasion and informality among firms and other taxpayers can complicate responses to tax policy, as tax authorities need to both think about tax design and enforcement at the same time. This is finally, I want to highlight this, that settings like Rwanda and many poorer countries are places where entrepreneurs are operating on very tight margins. So this may make even more important thinking about the welfare impacts uh, of tax policy in at least uh, the short and medium term. So the questions that I want to talk about today for tax policy specifically are what implications do the pandemic and lockdown measures have for tax revenues in low income countries, again, in the context of VAT specifically, and how can enforcement and other investments in tax policy best respond to balance the tax burden on struggling firms to ensure their longer run survival against the need for revenues in the short run and longer run to fund recovery efforts and um, sustain longer run investment in economic development. So the setting I examine these questions in is similar to Julia, Rwandan firms. I conducted a survey in January 2021 with a survey with a, a sample of Rwandan firms to track the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was a partnership with the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Rwanda and was supported by the PEDAL initiative on the economic impacts of the coronavirus. The sample was active firms in the tax net just before the pandemic hit Rwanda, um, sampled from February 2020. And we collected phone surveys with a nationally representative sample of close to 1500 firm owners. Um, and this included um, both small and medium firms um, like Julia's sample, but we also included larger firms um, to specifically focus on the, the larger impacts on their um, larger impacts on value added taxes. So larger taxpayers comprise most um, of the tax contributions uh, that we observe in value added taxes, but also corporate income tax. And this is similar in many other countries that are um, that share features with Rwanda. We collected both contemporaneous impacts um, uh, about responses during uh, the initial stage of the pandemic uh, and um, retrospective measures before and afterwards, but also um, uh, impacts measured at the time of survey in January 2021 to get a sense of how firms evolved in their responses. The focus was on economic responses to the pandemic and lockdown measures among firms, um, looking at operational challenges that they encountered and business adjustments and adaptations they made to cope with them. And specifically, we focused on the impact on supply chains, um, as this was one of the motivations for the funding behind this research. And I think this gives us a natural way to speak to some of the implications uh, for value added taxation in particular, um, which by its nature relies on, uh, on production networks and how supply chains are organized. <clears throat> 
And so in thinking about VAT applications and potentially tax policy more generally, we can think about the direct impacts on taxpayers through direct economic shocks to firms, but also how those effects are mediated or passed through supply chains and what um, uh, an effect on a particular firm may have on its clients and suppliers or even further down and up supply chains um, due to the nature of production networks and what that might mean for value added um, tax revenues and enforcement policy. So now I'll present you some findings from, from the survey. Um, first, on how firms, um, how quickly they were able to return to normal. In the short run, Rwanda implemented very strict lockdown measures in between March and May 2020 that involved curfews and travel bans. Rwanda was one of the more, um, was one of the countries to um, implement more intensive um, restriction measures relative to other African countries and other low income countries more generally. This meant that uh, around 80% of firms were at least temporarily closed during this period. But by June 2020, half of firms had um, resumed normal operations. By January 2021, in the longer run picture, however, 40 almost 40% of firms reported being yet to return to normal. So though they might be open, they weren't um, operating at full capacity. Manufacturing, mining, and construction firms were most affected in terms of being able to operate normally. And I think this potentially reflects the nature of the reliance on um, firms in the, in the construction sector, for example, being reliant on um, labor and due to regulation on movement within cities and different places, it was difficult to get access to workers. For manufacturing and mining, transport restrictions across provincial lines meant that it was difficult to get inputs or to ship um, products. By contrast, uh, firms in the agricultural sector were least affected. Um, in January, 10% uh, are reporting that their business remained entirely closed uh, due to COVID-19, um, but encouragingly only uh, less than 3% of businesses reported being permanently closed. Um, and again, these are formal firms. We don't have a great sense of what this means for informal sector firms, um, but the government took this as an encouraging sign that businesses were able to stay afloat. Um, but there's still the question of how they were able to do this and what this means for their longer run potential to survive. Um, relating to some of the issues um, Alessandro talked about in the previous presentation. So how did firms cope? Um, the figure at right shows some of the adjustments that firms made. Um, you can see there are many uh, different options provided in the survey, but the most common among them were uh, shift to digital interactions, which we observed throughout the world, to phone and inter internet interactions with both clients um, and suppliers. Uh, about half of firms also changed their hours of operation, and between 30 and 40 percent shifted the physical arrangement of their business to allow social distancing, altered their prices or even began to offer delivery services where before they had not. So many common adaptations that we observe in even developed country settings. I think the starkest finding that I want to highlight here is how businesses kept themselves afloat during this period. And we observe a large reliance on savings and new credit. 75% of um, business owners in the survey report spending their savings to cover business or living expenses during this time, whereas in the previous year, in 2019, before the pandemic, uh, less than 10% of firms reported doing this. Um, half of firms also report new borrowing since the startup lockdown measures, again up over, over 2019 by about um, fourfold. Uh, and most of this reliance is on uh, more informal forms of credit, so soliciting funds from family and friends uh, to cover expenses, though there is still some reliance on more formal forms of credit from banks or even um, more established forms of credit through suppliers. And I think I highlight this finding because I think it suggests that the longer run ability of firms to cope with shocks might be at least temporarily reduced, um, given that there's um, been they've been drawing down some of their personal savings or even relying on non-traditional forms of credit that might not be sustainable or available in the future. So what did this mean for firms in terms of impacts on revenues and employment? For the average firm, uh, they laid off 25% of their workforce. Again, this is driven by um, larger firms that laid off a large share of workers. The median firm had no layoffs, um, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in the results. Um, and uh, the expected decline in earnings is about the same level that firms relative to the previous year in 2019 expected their annual earnings to be 26% less um, than before. And you could think that this reflects a short run effect that firms were closed in April and May, for example, and that they lose those revenues, but they're able to return to normal by June um, for most firms, and therefore that we're just picking up a short run effect on revenues. But when we look at declines in monthly revenues in up until December 2020, which was the month before the survey was conducted, we still see that about 30% more firms are reporting lower monthly sales at that period relative to the previous year. And that's what this figure shows at right, the accumulative distribution of differences in monthly sales in February, uh, between February and April, we see a large um, change, but between um, February and December 2020 compared to February and December 
2019, there's about a 30% gap here. So 30% more firms are reporting negative uh, changes in sales. So what does this mean for, oh, yes, sorry. What does this mean for implications um, for tax revenues and enforcement, um, focus on VAT? And at first I wanna highlight some emerging evidence from low and middle income countries that suggests the impacts on firms and revenues are likely to be severe. This is work by Pierre Bacas and co-authors that uses micro simulations on um, data sets from various low and middle income countries to extrapolate or understand the potential implications for taxes, tax revenues, and responses that governments can undertake. They project a loss of tax revenues from the corporate sector of around 1.5% of baseline GDP in these countries. Um, in places like Rwanda, which have a smaller formal sector, the revenue shock is expected to be smaller. But um, at present, the government still forecasts about a 12% reduction in VAT revenues, which is still about 0.4% of baseline GDP. So I'm going to take some lessons from the survey and discuss their implications um, for value-added tax policy. Um, and to first talk about the, how supply chain linkages may mediate the impacts of value-added tax. Um, and second, talk about the, uh, the reasons for why there may be value in tailoring enforcement by both the size of firm or the sector of a particular firm, or more generally by firm type. Um, and finally, um, spend some time discussing why understanding the welfare implications of tax policy in a setting like Rwanda, but also potentially um, more developed countries is vital, particularly in a time um, like COVID. So first, supply chains and VAT. I think we're all familiar that production relies on networks, that firms require inputs to produce something and they need to to sell those, um, their outputs to someone. This means um, that shocks can pass from uh, individual firm to their clients, but also upstream to their suppliers through supply chains. Um, in settings where enforcement is imperfect, like Rwanda, however, this also means in invasion incentives can evolve or change over time. So you could think that if the cost, for example, of formal inputs rises, um, and in the context of the pandemic, this may be because um, international supply chains are disrupted, and so the costs of uh, inputs from abroad, which are um, imported by formal firms due to the nature of um, uh, imports being taxed in Rwanda, if those costs rise, firms may shift to informal suppliers. So this would mean um, an immediate loss of VAT revenue collected from formal firms because those informal firms won't be paying value-added tax because they won't be within the tax net. And in the survey, we see that about 55% of firms are still reporting difficulty getting supplies in January 2021. And this is driven by a variety of reasons um, or diverse causes. Interprovincial travel bans are still constraining delivery of goods um, within the country. Uh, suppliers simply have a lack of supply due to limitations on production or the availability of inputs. And about half of firms are still facing higher prices um, from their suppliers. Um, interestingly, uh, about 62% of firms report imports being interrupted as a cause for um, their inability to, to produce at normal levels. And this is interesting because Rwanda is a place where less than 10% of firms actually import directly. So this reflects the indirect nature of um, import or exposure to foreign inputs and that firms are often relying on others who import for their own um, production and the, how those firms may um, alter or those goods um, create intermediate inputs from, from foreign inputs. Um, so there's a large reliance on foreign inputs, even though most firms are not um, relying on them directly. And this is a point I'll return to um, in a second. So what does this mean for thinking about revenues and enforcement in the context of VAT? I think in a broad sense, I wanna suggest to you that pandemic, pandemic driven shifts in supply chains might be sticky. So we could think that a shift to informal suppliers, for example, might be easier to undertake for a firm in the context of the pandemic, but it might be more difficult for the tax authority or the government to bring those firms back into the tax net or to bring them back to reliance on more formal suppliers, which forms the basis of a stronger VAT chain. Um, and so the thinking about that, the shifts across um, different uh, inputs, for example, are different, uh, the, the taxable nature of those inputs, um, is uh, important for thinking about how persistent um, those changes may be and how tax policy can, can adapt to them. Also, we should think that isolated impacts, economic impacts will pass through to others. I think this is an obvious point, but I wanna focus on the, the, the um, um, point I, I just spoke about in terms of imports. Um, so in Rwanda, very few firms import uh, directly, but through other work that I've done with, uh, with co-authors, we estimate that around 98% of firms depend at least indirectly on imported inputs and that either they have a supplier who imports or that so one of their suppliers has a, has a supplier further up the chain who imports or vice versa, they have clients who are importing and they're somehow 
exposed to imports. So this means that disruption in international supply chains, for example, which we're seeing much more of recently, could lead to uh, effects on VAT through two margins. It could lead to a loss of VAT revenue at the border. It's more difficult to import goods because of these supply chain disruptions. So firms that are importing are affected. They're not paying value-added taxes on those imports they would normally bring into the country. So the government loses out on that VAT revenue, as well as tariff revenue. Um, but we could also think that there's implications down supply chain. So be because the availability of those inputs are reduced, there'll be production consequences um, to firms that depend on those inputs and potentially evasion responses uh, that may be um, that may persist in the long run. Now I want to turn to a separate question uh, of how to target enforcement. So I motivated this talk um, uh, with one of the points being that in these settings, tax authorities have to decide how to best target um, enforcement resources. And in places like Rwanda, VAT enforcement in particular is often focused on sectors or firm types that are believed to be at higher risk of evasion. So firms that the government or tax authority thinks um, are particularly um, likely to be evading due to the nature of their businesses. business. So before the pandemic, the um, Rwanda Revenue Authority often focused on the hotel and restaurant sector because that was a place where it was easy to hide transactions, for example. But I think in the context of the pandemic and, and the um, possibility that there may be heterogeneous economic shocks across firm types, this risks conflating those heterogeneous economic shocks with changes in evasion. So you could think um, if a tax authority is looking at trends in declaration behavior over time, and they view that one sector or firm type is trending differentially relative to others in their declaration behavior, that could either be due to real economic shocks on that sector, or um, to changes in evasion. So it's difficult for them to evaluate how to target VAT policy in a setting where those economic shocks may be evolving at the same time as evasion. And in Rwanda, I want to highlight some counterintuitive results we see um, that may highlight the nature or the complicated nature of this problem. So first, we see that medium and large size, large, large size firms in this figure are most um, impacted in terms of their expected change declines in revenues relative to the previous year, which is uh, different than I had at least had thought at the outset that I had expected smaller firms to be most impacted, but it's more towards the middle of the size distribution. And among the largest firms, those that are a, a little bit smaller that are most likely to be affected. Likewise, in contrast to the impacts on operations that I spoke about at the beginning, um, where we saw manufacturing and mining were most affected, as well as construction. When we look at expected changes in annual revenues, we see that the wholesale retail sector services and agricultural sectors are hardest hit. So if, we were, if the Revenue Authority were to focus on the, the ability of businesses to operate in contrast to expected changes in annual revenues, then that could produce a mistargeting of enforcement policy if they were seeking to um, identify those firm types that are at, at highest risk of evasion. So um, I think this highlights, in general, the importance of investing in tracking of economic shocks alongside enforcement and using that in a contemporaneous sense to collect data on shocks to firms separately from declaration behavior necessarily, and um, to use that to inform the targeting of VAT policy. So in my remaining minutes, I want to highlight um, some of the welfare implications of tax policy, which I think are important to think of in this setting. We often think of tax policy in places um, like Rwanda and poor countries more generally as balancing the distortion and burden on firms directly with the need for revenues to fund recovery. But sitting in the background is this, um, um, the importance of the long run sustainability of the tax system and ensuring that you don't permanently push firms out of the tax net as it, as it might be difficult to bring them back into the formal sector. And in low, less developed countries, self-employment in small firms and small firms themselves are a primary source of employment, but they are operating on very small margins. In Rwanda, the annual profit margins are a thousand US dollars, so that's less than three dollars a day. And in the survey, indeed, most the most requested form of policy assistance is tax deferral or relief relative to even subsidies or additional credit being made available. Um, and as a measure of direct uh, welfare impacts on firm owners, we see that 40% uh, reported not being able to meet their expenses in December 2020, so this is at like six to eight months after the start of the pandemic, and 51% reported reducing personal food consumption since the, since the start of the pandemic. So these, this means that the, the effects on firms are having direct impacts on the lives of citizens in a country where many people are living in poverty already. I think this underscores the value of recognizing that tax policy has direct impacts on the livelihoods of firms and potentially their survival, which has implications for thinking about the sustainability of future tax bases. So in my last minute, I want to 
take stock and summarize some of the lessons from the survey. I think the scope of COVID-19's impact on tax revenues is of course still emerging, but we know that tax policies now may be key to the long run, to sustaining the long run revenue potential of tax bases, particularly in places where these tax bases are still developing. Um, and forecasting and responding to VAT impacts, I think is uniquely complicated because it's affected both by economic shocks to firms and how that affects the government's ability to recover revenues from them, but also changes in, in um, invasion incentives and invasion behavior within supply chains. And the evidence from Rwanda, I think, suggests that accounting for the structure of supply chains matters, of course. Um, second, that heterogeneous impacts on firms uh, should be part and parcel of the uh, targeting of enforcement efforts, and it's important to know about these heterogeneous impacts to inform those efforts. And finally, that paying attention to the tax policy effects on welfare of firm owners and firm survival, I think, is especially important in a time like this. Um, thank you. I'm providing a, a note to our to our policy brief um, here. Thank you so much, Gabriel, and also for sticking into the time. Uh, it's such a rich paper, so uh, much appreciated. So uh, the discussion will be uh, introduced by Eric Hutton, who is a uh, econo senior economist in our Revenue Administration Division and uh, very well uh, known for his work on uh, VAT compliance. So uh, Eric, go ahead. Eric, we can't hear you. Nope. Hear me now? Yes, there we are. Very good. There's four microphones to choose from, apparently. <laughs> Uh, sorry. So uh, thank you, everyone, uh, and good day to everyone here at, at the conference. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, for the very interesting paper. Um, uh, paper is still in the works, uh, and I think it's got some real uh, promise to it, some really interesting results to draw from. There's two lines uh, presented during the presentation in, there in the paper that, that I'd like to uh, focus on. Uh, one is the conflating economic shocks with evasion. This is, uh, this is what my life work is based on, is trying to to, to, to break those things down because, and for a tax administration, this is very important because what we see often is that there's a forecasting models for how revenues should behave and, and how they're gonna to behave to a certain shock, how they're gonna to to behave to a certain policy change. And if the model, if the results are different than the model, the, 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 the error is usually blamed on compliance. It says, well, the tax administration didn't do their job. And so it's, it's always very important for a tax administration to understand how revenues are being forecasted and how they're expected to meet those and to have their own uh, analysis of, of what might be going on with that model. And your other statement about tailoring enforcement by firm size and sector, that that's, that's not only important for the enforcement, but it's also important on the forecasting side. And, and that's where I think some of your data would be really interesting to suss some of that out as to what's going on by firm size and sector. You do a little bit of you do a little bit of breakdown by firm size, and then you do a separate breakdown by sector. But it would be good to see that matrix of how how your results are saying who's seeing the decline in in revenue. Firm size, you, you had this interesting result that it's large firms, but is it large firms across all sectors? Which sectors are being affected? which large firms and which different sectors are being affected because the tax base is not uniform across all of these things. So if the if the if it's large taxpayers in the agricultural sector who are affected, they're not a big contributor to the tax base in Rwanda for the VAT, then that might not have a severe impact on revenues. Also, if it's the large taxpayers in the hotel sector who are affected by this, but they have very poor compliance historically revenues again might not be affected because they were already affected we did a a, a study of uh well we, we did a, a the the compliance gap study in in rwanda a couple of times i think the results are public and we have the breakdown by sector which can be drawn on to try and look at how revenues might be affected taking into these compliance and it's very important that you take into account the compliance by sector when doing revenue forecasting when we are working in uh, on, in a country in another region in the world, I won't say the country or, or, or where we were, but there was a there was a, a they were trying to get more revenue, and the policy response was to increase the rate on the hotel sector because the hotel sector had a reduced rate, and this predicted a, a large increase. The, the the model predicted a very large increase in revenues. They're expecting a billion more, whatever the currency was. Uh, and that didn't come 
come to pass. The following year, revenues didn't move at all. The, rev the rate was increased, the revenues didn't move at all. And so the Revenue Administration got blamed saying, oh, you didn't, you didn't enforce this new change. Well, we had already done a, we had actually done a compliance gap estimate for that, that, that country. And we'd already shown that the compliance in the hotel sector was abysmal, uh, just about the worst we've ever seen in the sector. So there shouldn't have been any expectation of additional revenues until that compliance had been addressed. Uh, so the model was saying, oh, there's some change in what the tax administration, there's no change. The, the, the model was, was poorly designed. It didn't take into account firm size sector by, uh, uh, in, its, in its prediction of revenue. So this is very important. So drawing out those results, if you, could, if you can be showing not just firm size, firm sector as separate things, but, but pulling those out and then tying those to the tax base and then possibly getting some tied to compliance, then we can have a, a richer model for doing revenue forecasts and revenue expectations and the expectation of what might be coming from the shock. We heard in the paper earlier this morning that the, the, uh, the counterintuitive uh, re re response that compliance might have improved in Rwanda during the shock. And we've actually seen that in a number of countries. You know, the, 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 the knee-jerk reaction is that when there's a shock, compliance will, will decline. And so we're expecting revenues to go down, not just because the tax base goes down, but compliance will go down as well because people will hold on to their, their, their cash instead of paying their taxes. But we've actually found in a number of countries that that doesn't hold true, that the, it, it, that the, that the, revenue, the, the tax base might have gone down and revenues gone down, but it wasn't due to compliance. Compliance might have stayed same or actually increased. And our working theory, as much as, as, as was uh, discussed in the paper this morning, is that that's because the large taxpayers who are, you know, were 80% uh, uh, of the revenue, though they're 20% of the si size, that that tax base is getting more concentrated. And so it's 90% of the revenue now in 10% of the firms. And those 10% are more compliant. Their, their, their business might have gone down, but they're going to stay compliant because they're watched like a hawk. And so the compliance might improve overall. So in you're looking at your enforcement responses and revenue responses, we have to look at that full spectrum of size, size and sector. So I think it's very important that we're that we're pulling all of that together and drawing out some of those results on that matrix type of, 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 of level would be would be highly interesting. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, no, these are great points, and um, I think it's also um, Gabriel. If you look at your data, you see this huge difference between medians and averages. So uh, this suggests that there are some very large ones that are. Uh, driving the averages, I guess. Uh, but these are great points. Uh, maybe Eric, uh, you can put your uh, the link to this study that you mentioned on the, the VAT gap for Rwanda in the chat, if uh, so people can access it. So Gabriel, maybe you want to uh, respond to Eric's points? Two minutes. Yeah, and thank you. Um, th yeah, thank you for that excellent discussion. Um, I think I'll just respond quickly to thinking about why we see such differences in the average and median here. Rwanda is a very small country in terms of its um, size of uh, its large taxpayer base. So there's about 400 large taxpayers there. And so a lot of the like differences in the average and median we observe here are driven by a few large firms um, being severely affected or doing well as a result of the pandemic. And it's difficult to separate those two things out. I think Julia's work focused, um, I believe, more on the small and medium set of firms, which are the larger share of firms in the, in the economy and may relate more to like the, thinking about the welfare implications that I included with. Um, but it also complicates the 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 project of trying to um, map out that full matrix, because we often might have just one firm sitting in like the large and mining sector. Um, though I think there are some sectors like hotel and restaurants and service sector firms that it would be really interesting to focus on, on those questions there. I think what I took from your comments also, or uh, something that came to mind was um, the importance of making tax authorities or even the tracking of these economic impacts more nimble, at least in times like, like COVID. And I know that's difficult in places where tax authorities and governments are resource strapped and have a lot of other things on their plate, but making the ability to shift or test out different types of policies and respond quickly and adapt them to what you observe in terms of responses, maybe even more important now and generating and building in some more flexibility in a time like this, I think could be especially important. Um, and one potential explanation for why um, uh, the compliance might have increased, and again, Julia could speak more to this, is thinking about what benefits could be coming down the line for firms. Like if you, if it's particularly large firms that are becoming more more compliant, they want to demonstrate that they're um, 
doing everything above board that they're fully compliant in order to have a chance to receive um, uh, relief or credit um, in the future in the next period um, and that could be a motivation for why compliance at least in the short run increases um, to allow firms to access those benefits further down the line i think those would be larger firms in the rondon setting uh, but again thank you very much and i look forward to pushing this research further thanks gabriel uh there's one question from the chat so um, there's also one minute left so um, maybe we can take that so from henry Caperi, who is asking, uh, well, in general, firms may have been affected uh, on the downside. Are there some sectors that have actually improved in terms of revenue? And I saw in one of your figures, there was something on the construction. Uh, so maybe you can say a bit about that. Yeah, so the, in, the median construction firm uh, had a negative decline that was similar to other sectors. We observed on average that um, construction sector firms were doing more, better than last year um, during the pandemic. And I, I'm not sure necessarily why this is the case. I tried to dig in a little bit to it and understand what's going on. And I think it's um, most likely a result of access to government contracts for building um, out something it, it, that was already um, pre-spent during the pandemic. So the government was making a lot of um, I was making a lot of plans for building um, housing that was supported by the government in advance of the pandemic, and I think they were able to carry through on some of those promises um, once things got a little bit back to normal um, during 2020 in Rwanda before the second lockdown. Um, and so I think that just reflects a large government spending project that happened to be in the construction sector, um, but I, I need to dig in a little bit more to it. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thanks both for excellent discussion. Uh, this is really, really uh, Excellent work um, and, and exciting uh, research. Uh, so thanks a lot.